Visit sailrite.com for project supplies, tools, and instructions. Hi, I'm Eric Grant with uh, Sailrite. We're on a Pardo 38, and in this tutorial video, we're gonna show you how to make a sun pad cover for your boat. This uh, boat has cushions up here, and we don't wanna remove those cushions every time the boat's not in use. So why not make a cover? That way you can keep them on the boat. This cover is made from 100% solution dyed acrylic, marine grade fabric. Sayrite has many to choose from. This happens to be a Sunbrella brand. So let's get started and show you how to make your very own sun pad cover. In this first chapter, we'll be patterning for our sun pad cover. Okay, we're gonna pattern this. This uh, has some shape to it. You'll see it at the top near the headrest. And we're gonna put strapping tape down because strapping tape uh, usually comes off of uh, surfaces better than any other ta tape. Um, so we're gonna stay really close to the edge here so we can put double side tape on top of this. And we're gonna go all the way around the perimeter. So now we have the uh, double side tape part number 129 and we're putting it right on the strapping tape. Now that doesn't mean that we can put it, we're, that we're going to put the fastener here. We'll probably put the fastener a little bit deeper out here, but this is what, what's going to be used to secure the pattern material. When you come to a corner, just create wrinkles in the double side tape and we're going to go all around the perimeter with this. We're putting the Duraskrim pattern material down. Um, it isn't a totally flat surface, so it's always a wise idea to pattern. If we didn't have enough to cover all the way to the sides, which are really pretty close, we would take uh, packing tape and just tape on another piece of Duraskrim. I do that all the time. So we're gonna peel off the transfer paper and we're gonna start basting this down until it looks good. Okay, so we have some shape at the pillows. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start basting here. Nice thing about patterning is that you can uh, reapply it if you don't like it, if it's too loose. But right now this is looking good. So we're gonna work all the way around to where the pillow begins on the uh, port side. It's always a good idea to get rid of excess pattern material. Um, this makes it more difficult the more pattern material you have. So here's where we have that uh, headrest and uh, we need to get the pattern material down. I've got it everywhere. I've got it all around here secured down here so it's nice and fairly tight. It doesn't have to be perfect. And we've come to this corner. So what do we do here? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a pleat here. So I'm going to take the fabric and come down and there's going to be a fold at this corner. That's usually a good spot to put a pleat. So I'm going to put my fingers in here, create a pleat and come down to our uh, double-sided tape okay and if you don't like it you can put take it up again and reposition it and it looks like we're gonna have a corner here so we're gonna probably have a pleat here as well to take up the excess fabric and you should put it on the corner as best as you can so we're gonna come down and we'll want to do this exact same thing on the uh, port side our cushion has a headrest which is higher in size than the cushion we had to accommodate for the difference in heights and shape by creating pleats and gaps in the pattern. You see, the fabric sits on the deck, then rises up and takes on the height of the headrest and then transitions to an almost horizontal top surface. That shape can cause excess fabric to be present, which needs to be taken up, or it may cause a lack of fabric which can make a hard spot unless it is released. That fact requires pleats slash darts to be made in the pattern or slits slash gaps to be cut into the pattern. How do you know what's required? Basically, you look at how the pattern is sitting on the surface and create a pleat slash dart or slits slash gaps in the pattern to allow it to relax nicely over the surface as we are here on the starboard side. That looks pretty good there. So this is excess fabric. This one, I don't, I'm don't. i not happy with it yet. I've got a tight spot here, which means I need to cut away fabric, but I don't really want to get into the area where I'm going to be, uh, where I'm going to be uh, 
actually drawing my pattern on, so I'd like to stop short of that. That allows that to separate, because that definitely wants to separate. And we have extra fabric here, so I'm going to work it into this pleat. Nice thing about double-sided tape is you can just keep working with it in the pattern until you have it exactly the way you want it. Don't expect to get every single wrinkle out of this. This is a cover. Um, it's, it's fairly taut, as you can see here, but it's not so tight that it's going to be hard to secure. So that looks pretty good, I think. I'm going to start right here, and I'm going to take a marker, and I'm going to come to the top of my pleat, and I'm just going to come straight down the side. Now on this side, we want that line to be right over top of that as well. And we want to stop right there to, at that pleat. Okay, so that's how you mark a pleat. And we'll do the same thing with this one here. So we'll come over here, we'll go up to that point, and then we mark it on this side directly across from it. Okay, good. Because this is a, a, a deep in inset here, this required a slit in their pattern material. So what I'm going to do is put a, a, a two lines here, and then uh, from here and here. You may be asking, how do I determine where to mark at the end of those lines? Well, it does not matter much as long as you mark the gap at some point and then you measure from point to point next. What I'll actually do is I'll measure it because when you get this off, you're not going to know the, the measurement. And we have an inch and a half, see, from edge to edge. So I'm going to mark one and a half inches. And we're going to do the same thing on the port side because it has a slit there too. So this is the snad that we're going to be using. It's a 40 millimeter snad. We don't want to drill into this boat in, in, in as few spots as possible. And if I put it right to the edge here, I don't want it to be rubbing up against the cushion. So that means the placement is right about there. And I'm going to take my marker. There's the center of it, which means our fasteners are going to be placed right about there. Um, so we need a flange that's going to basically cover this. And I think I might come actually all the way out to here with my flange. So I'm going to mark this snap right there, and this is the finished edge. Okay, so I can see my strapping tape, which is right here. And what I'm going to do, and I, I, did I get the strapping tape on perfectly? Well, probably not totally perfectly, but it's a pretty good edge to follow. So I'm going to just put dash lines all around the perimeter. So we're going to add an inch and this will be the finished edge and we're going to add a double hem so we're going to be adding more fabric there. Uh, we'll talk about that here in a minute after we get it marked all around the perimeter. So see these wrinkles here? Don't worry about them. Th these we're not going to be sewing in, only the pleats here. So just ignore that. Now an important thing to do is to mark starboard which is south, starboard out, and this side would be port out, so pot. There are channels under here to allow water to escape. Very nice design. Um, so I'm just going to mark that and I'll just put water on it and I'll do the same thing on the uh, starboard side over here. Okay, so I've, uh, I'm going to put a snad here and I marked an X everywhere we're going to put a snad and then for us uh, we're going to put them about, uh, let's see, it looks like about 15 inches or so apart. So we're going to just mark them at that location with an X. So where we have a position for a fastener, I'm going to lift the material up and I'm going to hopefully mark it with a grease pencil so I know where I need to put the fasteners. There's a ceramic coating on this so it makes it really difficult to do that. Okay, so what I'm going to do, since, it, since our grease pencil doesn't mark on this because it's got such a ceramic coating on it, is I'm going to put one little dot on here. This would actually come off pretty easily with my marker, like that. We're going to do that for the snad locations. We're going to take it off now, and uh, we do not like to install the uh, fasteners in the cover when we get it sewn. We like to install them on the uh, surface first and uh, then put them in the fabric. So we're going to install snads and uh, the locks next. Coming up, we'll be installing the fasteners on the boat. 
To secure our cover, we will be using snaps and the YKK snads, which do not require drilling through the fiberglass. Snaps and snads will be used all around the flange edges. At the two back corners, we will install one locks pull it up fastener to be sure that the cover does not blow away by accident, since locks fasteners are a locking type fastener. However, the locks fastener requires us to drill into the fiberglass. In retrospect, we probably should have just used snads and snaps for everything because they really do snap quite securely together, especially when you're using the 40 millimeter domed stud YKK snad. For this chapter on fasteners, we're going to start with the LOX stud, which has to be drilled to secure it to the fiberglass. So we're going to start there. So we've set our countersink bit to go the depth of this LOX stud. And this bit's a little bit on the small side. We're going to switch to a larger bit, an eighth inch bit, um, to put this in. But this is our starting point. So we're going to go through this hole here. As we've mentioned, this bit is a little bit on the small side. We're going to switch up to an eighth inch drill bit and enlarge it slightly. We'll not be showing doing that. And we have a countersink bit on it. I'm going to go slowly here. Chamfering the hole before the installation of the fastener will help to prevent the gel coat from cracking around the hole later on. Go a little bit more. Uh, it's a pretty good cavity, but I'm gonna go a little bit deeper than that. This is butyl tape. It's highly recommended for bedding of fasteners, much better than silicone because uh, silicone attracts dirt and it's very difficult to get silicone off of fiberglass. I'm gonna wrap it around the threads of my fastener and I'm going to use plenty of it because I want it to ooze out. So there we are. This is a nine millimeter socket for this fastener. And you want to do this by hand. You want to feel the fastener going in. When installing fasteners in fiberglass, we recommend using a hand tool like a socket as we are here, or if it's a different type of fastener, maybe a screwdriver. Why is that? If you do it by hand, you can feel the amount of force that the screw is being required to go through the hole. If there's too much force, you may want to stop and drill your pilot hole a little bit bigger to allow the fastener to go through the fiberglass without causing damage to the gel coat surface. So that's why we do it this way, though I am guilty with using mechanical tools every once in a while. There we go. Now all you have to do is basically use some of the butyl and wad it up and it comes off pretty nicely. Now that our lock stud is installed, let's concentrate on installing the 40 millimeter snad to the deck of our boat. And first we need to prep the surface. We've cut a little piece of cardboard uh, to match the size of the snad base. And I'm using alcohol on a rag to remove uh, the coating from the manufacturer. And then I'm going to dry it with a dry spot on the rag. And then once that's done, you break the ampule, the primer 94, and you put a coating of this on. And I usually put on two coatings. So I put that one on and then I give it a minute or so. And you do have a working time of approximately 10 to 15 minutes and then this thing starts to dry up and so make sure you get enough ampules for your whole project. And then we're ready to install the snad. He's got it here. So I'm going to lift this up and he knows right where to put it. And then just apply pressure. 
and your SNAD is installed. We highly recommend using an adhesive promoter like Primer 94, available from Sailrite. Otherwise, they don't stick as well. Okay, it's a good idea not to use the SNAD for at least 72 hours. Uh, it gets stronger with time. The bond becomes even uh, better uh, after 72 hours, so don't use them until then. And then we're going to move on to the next one. We've got our little black dot here. We're going to position this right where we need it and do the same thing again. In this chapter, we'll be sewing our fabric panels together. We measured the widest width here, and I get about 74 inches. I had to hold the fabric up over here to get it measured. Uh, we need to add extra for the flange around the side, which means that we have to sew two panels together. And I'm just going to go right down the center from uh, port to starboard. We'll have two panels and we're going to do a semi flat filled seam. So let's show you how to do that. So we have six yards of fabric and I cut it in half and I'm going to put double sided tape down one edge of these panels. Uh, there is no right side or wrong side to this acrylic uh, marine grade fabric. So now that we have the double sided tape on, I'm going to peel off the transfer paper. So once the uh, transfer paper is off, I'm going to position this panel so that the edges are pretty much lined up, which will make it much easier for basting. And I am using 100% solution dyed acrylic fabric here. This is the Sombrella brand, but we also carry a, a secondary brand called uh, Sattler, um, which is a little bit less expensive. Both brands would work great for a cover like this. So we're just going to baste it down the length and show you what's next. To create a semi-flat felt seam, I'm going to use a magnetic guide and I'm going to put it on the half inch a mark on the needle plate and our needles in center position. And we just, we're just going to sew a straight stitch a half inch from this edge. The fabric's basted down so I don't have to worry about it moving. Oops, I don't want to lose my thread. And you can reverse the beginning, it's probably going to be cut short, but not necessary. And all we want to do is just guide the fabric and I'm sewing a six millimeter straight stitch here um, and I'm using V92 polyester thread and a size 20 needle. Okay, sometimes if you hold the fabric up like this this actually works pretty well to keep your stitch nice and straight. And then I bury my needle and then I reposition and sew again. Now we have the fabric sewn here. We're going to splay it open and create a top stitch. And I'm going to roll this so that it goes underneath the throat of the sewing machine. So first, let's splay it open nicely. So our seam allowance on the bottom side can go left or right, it doesn't really matter because there's no water rolling off of this. So I'm just going to position it going to the left and I actually like to sometimes crease it in advance. So you can take any object but this is the Sayrite canvas patterning ruler and just make sure that seam is falling that direction I can feel it under here, pulls left and right and then crease it, which will make it have a little bit of a mem memory so when you take it to the machine it will just want to naturally fold there. So we're going to do this all the way down its length. So I actually got a second helper, my cameraman, and we rolled this up so that we can get it under the throat of the sewing machine. And to keep it in position, what I'm going to do is just use a couple uh, spring clamps. So we're sewing our top stitch here and I'm sewing in the seam allowance on the bottom side. This is the stitch that everyone is going to see and you can see I'm using the uh, center foot on the right side as my guide and posi positioning it along that crease that we made. Um, I'm also using the smooth uh, uh, foot set, the center foot only, because I like the opening so I can see exactly where I'm stitching. Um, that isn't the foot that comes standard with the machine, but I use it on almost all my straight stitching now. In this chapter, we'll be adding a flange and creating our darts in our pattern. 
I've cut a piece of Duraskrim extra and we're just gonna tape it to this. This is not uncommon if you don't have enough pattern material, <coughs> you can tape pieces together. So I'm just gonna use some packing tape and we're gonna tape it on securely on this side and possibly even on the inner side. Going back to the boat when we were patterning, if you remember, we put a dashed mark all along the strapping tape because we could see through the pattern material. And then we decided that we were going to have the flange edge come just to the opposite side of the 40 millimeter dome. You can see it here marked F edge. So we've decided to make it a little bit bigger flange, which is a good idea. So we actually make it one and a half inches from the dash mark, which gives us a larger flange and also make sure that our cover is not installed too tightly because we want it to be a rather loose fit for a cover like this. I'm going to use the uh, Sayerite uh, patterning ruler and I'm going to have the dotted line run into this area here. So um, I put my marker at one and a half and I'm going to guide it and extend it out from those dotted lines one and a half inches. Now you can use any other tool like this too. You could actually take a tape measure and just uh, put dash lines one and a half inches from these if you'd like. There are all kinds of ways to do this. So here's another way to do it. I'm going to try to keep my hands out of the way. Probably not as neat, but it does work. Here we have a pleat and we have no dotted lines. So I basically stopped uh, marking there and I'm just going to join this so it looks fairly pleasing and like it runs in line with it. Same thing over here. We stopped here. I'm just going to do this manually. Now I can't stress this enough. We're going to cut on this line, but you want to trust your pattern. Now obviously if your lines are a little bit crooked because you didn't scribe them very neatly, then you want to fair them out. But if you see something that looks like a random weird shape, keep cutting. This is actually a slit in the fabric to allow the fabric to expand. Now I'm not going to cut this out. I'm actually going to leave that in here because we measured from here to here and it's one and a half inches. So I'm actually going to cut over here and then just start cutting over here. So here's one of the pleats. We have uh, four of them. I'm going to use the clear acrylic ruler and put a line that's a half inch from there up like that and then on this side a half inch on the inside here as well up like that and the idea is that we're going to cut this out so we're going to do this this with all the pleats and this will allow the half inch seam allowance that we need to sew this excess fabric in so this is how you do pleats we're just trimming right beside those lines and I can just take out this excess fabric on the bottom side. Don't cut the top because this is just done because we didn't have enough fabric. Okay. Coming up, we'll be cutting our fabric to size. I'm going to take my pattern material and I'm going to fold it in half. Now it won't be symmetrical, hardly any boats are. And we're going to find the center. So we're going to try to line it up as best as possible. So this is the center here and we're going to do that at the top as well. Okay, so there's my center line and there's my stitch. I'm going to put this right in the middle of the stitch and the fold and I'm going to pin it in place close to that just so that I make sure that my pattern stays where I want it to. Like that. And we'll do that at the other, other end as well. Okay, once we have these two ends pinned, we're going to pin the corners as well because I don't have a big enough work table to get this to fit on the table. I could put it on the floor and I wouldn't have to worry as much about this, but uh, I don't like working on the floor. So I'm going to pin the corners on all four edges as well. So I'm going to use 
the tempered cutting glass on the bottom side. And I'm going to use a hot knife mainly because of the fact that we are going to make an edging to match the shape and then we're going to use a binding on the edge. And if you have a hot knifed edge, if your stitch ever falls close to that binding, it doesn't pull out because the edge is basically sealed. So we're going to trim all around and when I run off the edge of the uh, tempered cutting glass on the bottom side, I will just uh, move it down the path and continue cutting. Now here, uh, I don't want to cut through this, so I, I'll actually cut around this. I mean, I, because of the fact that we have to do some measuring, I'll just cut right up to this. And then we'll start here. So we'll trim that a little, a little bit later on. We're going to do this all around the perimeter. Sarite has two versions of the Edge hot knife. This is the cordless version. I love it. And we have a corded version, which is a little bit less money. Um, both of them work fine, but this is definitely my favorite. Okay, so here we're going to cut out where these pleats go. Like that, and like that. And take this fabric out, because this will be sewn together. And we'll do the same thing to this one over here and on the other side. We are now on this part that has to separate and we have to separate an inch and a half from this edge. That's why I left that extra fabric on here. So I'm going to take a soapstone. I'm going to mark the center like that. And I'm actually going to go all the way to the top up here, which is right about there. Okay. And half of one and a half is three quarter. So three quarter is right there. Three quarter is right there. And then three quarter would be right here, half of that uh, measurement we took on the bow, which is one and a half. So there we go. And this goes down to that. And this goes down to that. Okay. Okay, with that done, our edge actually falls here where we at one and a half inches from the dotted lines. So I'm just going to cut. That one's a little bit off because I'm just joining it to this side right through there. So now this isn't an inch and a half because remember when we were on the boat, we measured from that point to that point spread apart an inch and a half. So don't be alarmed by that. So now I'm just going to cut this out, except for this isn't sewn together. This is going to be a split or we have excess fabric or we don't have enough fabric here. That's why we're splitting it there. So we're going to take this out. Okay, so this is a gap. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a, a G there. This is actually a pleat that's sewn, so I'll put a P there. And obviously this is a pleat. So we don't get confused when it comes time to sew it. So P is for pleat and G is for gap. This is port out. So I'm going to write pout just close to the edge over here. And obviously that's sout, so I'll mark that over there. So we know what side is the outside surface. We're going to remove our pins and the pattern material and we're going to sew our pleats. It, is it, do I need to mark sout and pout? No, not really, because I have a seam down the center that indicates what's the outside surface. In this chapter, we'll be sewing darts into our cover. So this is a P, which means it's a pleat. So I'm going to put double-sided tape on one side, put it close to the edge because we don't want to sew through it because we don't want it to be visible. Outside surfaces would face each other, so we peel off the backing, and then this gets folded. Bring this fabric around to get the, it to take the shape, right like that. Okay, and you might want to put a, a clip on there just to keep it in place, and we'll do the same thing with this one. Outside surfaces face each other. Oops, you got to take off the double or the transfer paper this is the outside faces each other hold it so the edges are flush like that and there we go these little clips are actually pretty awesome 
they can help hold things that don't want to pull apart. So we'll put them here too. So we did the, uh, the pleats or the darts. This is sometimes called a dart rather than a pleat um, on this side as well. Let's take it to the machine. I'm going to put the magnetic guide on at the half inch spot right there. Needles in the center position. We're going to remove these clips now that we have it close to the machine. And we're going to start up here at the top. And I'm going to do some reversing here. Going off the edge of the fabric. And then just sewing right alongside of this dart or pleat. And do some reversing down at the bottom as well. Okay. So our dart is now sewn. And we're going to do that to all the other darts. So in preparation for a top stitch, if you want to do it for your dart or pleat, uh, here's where we have bulk fabric. I don't want to sew it necessarily into just a single layer. So what I'll do is I'll lay this down and I can actually feel right here at the top where that tail ends and it ends right here. It comes down here. So I mark it with a soapstone. That way I don't sew into a single layer of fabric and my seam allowance is going to go that direction. So because of, my, of that, because of where I marked it, I know where I need to start sewing. And I will just do some reversing here. And we will sew down this side with the center foot lined up on the left side of our first stitch. And at the bottom, we'll do some reversing here. And let's show you what that looks like. So now our dart or pleat has a top stitch. And that's what it looks like on the outside. And on the underside, you can see that we're in our seam allowance. If I pull on this stitch here, that'll pull that knot into there. So that looks great. Next up, cutting and basting our facing to the cover. This is some of our scrap, and we're going to cut facings to match the shape because this has a lot of shape at the corners. The corners are the biggest issue. So this is our cover. The outside surface is up. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay this down as flat as possible, making sure I have at least two inches of extra fabric, um, which I do to the curve. So let's lay this down. Let's put a bag on this and let's come over here, spread this out. Put a bag on that. And then uh, you can see I'm smoothing out an area that is uh, uh, about two inches or so because that's my flange. I'm going to cut my reinforcement strip at two inches. So what we're going to do is from this point here, I'm going to mark there because that's where that uh, gap has to be. I'm going to make sure the fabric is flat. I'm just using my soapstone to go around it. Laying it flat, following the contour. It's not going to be perfect, but it's going to be so close that uh, it'll just take this, this edge or this corner nicely. I'm going to go around here like that. I'm going to move this. And I'm almost to the straightaway here. So what I'm going to do, oops, like that, is I'm going to put a line here so I know where it should start. So here's our piece. Okay, so I have my uh, uh, canvas patterning ruler. I'm going to put it in at two inches. And I'm going to follow that curve, based, keeping it perpendicular to the line or parallel, I should say, but basically keeping the uh, ruler perpendicular to it so that it's an even two inches all the way. Okay, and here's where we're going to stop it. And over here, this is, I'm going to leave this a little bit long because I just don't know exactly where that one's going to be. Uh, and we're going to cut this out with a hot knife. I'm going to put a B on this because this is the side we want basting tape on, the same side that we marked on. And what I like to do, especially with the corners, is put basting tape on both long edges. 
following the curve. So when you get to a curve with basting tape, you just introduce a wrinkle because it helps. He has to sh shrink and expand to go around the curve. That's all you do. And I'm getting uh, fairly close to the edge and no reason to do the small edges. And we'll do the same thing over here. The reason I use it on both sides is that we're going to sew binding on the edge and we're also going to sew on this edge. This just keeps it in place. You don't have to worry about it moving. I'm going to peel off the transfer paper uh, and we're going to baste it to that edge in advance. And this is the edge that we know is right, so I've got a mark on it. So I'm just going to start it there. And we just want this edge to line up. And because we've cut the shape into it, it should line up fairly well. Remember on the table it was laying flat, so if you've got any in inconsistencies, don't worry about it. Just try to match it up as best as possible. So I'm trying to force it up against the edge because there's shape that obviously doesn't want to lay perfectly flat still, even though we have a curve in this, but man, it's pretty close. Look at that. A few little small wrinkles, but they are going to come completely out when we sew it. So I am happy with that. This edge will be bound. Now I have extra over here that I'm just going to cut out. You can see there. So I'm going to just make a curved piece right here going up a few inches, but I want it to be pretty much even on the side. So I'm just going to measure up 11 inches right about at this corner and we'll put a line here. And if I do 11 inches over here, which is right there, that would put a line here. So that should be pretty even. And then I can take my scrap here that it has the seam in it. And I know it's upside down right now, but it's going to be basted that way anyway. And I can pull this up and this takes very little fabric. So, oh, I want to put this underneath. I'm sorry. Let's go lift this up, push this up. And I'll kind of center it there. This, it isn't going to match, so don't think that that cutout is going to match. And then we still have to do this. And if I don't have enough fabric at this junction here, then I'll obviously trim it down. But all I'm going to do is this, and we're going to make it two inches inside of this edge and cut it out with a hot knife. Okay, so we have our piece cut out. Uh, we're ready to baste it on just like we did the other ones. We're going to, since we had enough fabric, we're going to start there at our line that we struck. And the rest of the cover is pretty much um, straightaways. So we don't have any more of these curves that we have to contend with. So it'll be much easier. So we'll show you what we do there after I get this one basted on. This edge, if I measure from where I stopped here to where I ended there, is around uh, 57 inches. But I'm going to just go at 58, 59 inches just to make sure. And it does have a little bit of a curve to it, but I'm not going to follow it. I'm going to cut a straight piece and I'll show you how that goes down. This is the uh, factory edge and it's already sealed, so I don't have to cut that with a hot knife. Because I'm just going to make a straight strip, I'm going to use the clear acrylic ruler, which makes fast work of this. Then I can just mark it, cut this edge with a hot knife. Okay, we've got double sided tape on it and I'm just going to overlap this by about a half inch or so. We're going to cut out where the gap is after we get this basted on. But remember this edge is the edge that isn't perfectly straight. We can still follow this pretty nicely because it is a gentle curve with just a straight piece and it goes on just as easy as that. Now I've got an overlap here of several inches. Uh, I'll just cut it so that it's about a half inch or so. In this chapter we'll be sewing facing and binding to our cover. So our banding is two inches right there, but I don't want to sew too close to the edge. So I'm going to sew at one and three quarter inches, which means I'm going to put this down. This is a good way to get your stitch that, that's, bit, that's large. I like to sew with the outside surface up. So I think that goes right about there. Let's measure it to make sure to the needle. Oops, I'm definitely off. It's hard to move. Oof, oof. So we got a little bit more. There we go. Perfect. So one and three quarter inches, which uh, will sew this flange on. I'm starting here at the bottom of the cover. It doesn't really matter. 
um, we are going to check our stitches. The reason I like to sew with the uh, outside surface facing up is the stitch usually on the top looks better than the stitch on the bottom. So I'm just going to do a little bit of reversing here and we're going to keep it up against the guide and sew around the entire perimeter. Let's also check the stitch. So our stitch is a little bit tight, so I, I'm going to back off some tension a little bit and we'll check it again here. Let's see what that looks like. Oh yeah, that looks much better. And how does it look on the back side? And are we stitching in about the right spot? I'm trying to get this over so you can see. Yeah, we're about a quarter inch from the edge of the facing, which is fine. I don't want to miss the facing, so we're good to go. Okay, now here, here we're getting to that part that's a little bit rounded. So I'm just gonna push down. Make sure that the flange hasn't moved. We're gonna round this edge. It's actually pretty easy sewing. Just pull the fabric. Flatten it out here, the, the fabric's not completely flat here. So I'm gonna push it so that I get the wrinkles worked out. See it right there. Good. Got shape here, that's what this is going on here. So don't uh, be alarmed by this, just work it out so you're not sewing any of these wrinkles in. If you have to, peel it up a little bit and work out any kind of major wrinkles. There we go. Okay, we're just gonna keep doing this around the perimeter. Oh, there we're. Should we show? No, nah, I don't think so. Oh, good. Okay. Now we're doing straight away. Nice and easy. I'm using the one inch swing away binder and a 100% solution dyed acrylic uh, binding. This is a bias binding. And I like to sew and check my stitch tension because this is uh, obviously a little bit thicker. It's four layers I'm sewing through. That looks pretty good. So I'm happy with that and I'm happy with the placement. I have my needle to the right. I'm going to cut that off and I'm going to run this up to here. I'm going to start at the bottom edge down here. So this is where it'll overlap. But I want it to overlap not in the seam allowance because that's rather thick. So I'm going to go like over here. Okay, and make sure this is back so I sew through this, lower my foot, and I'm not going to reverse because I'm going to be sewing over that here in a little bit. And what we want to do is we want to make sure that we push the fabric in towards the exiting part of the binder so that we don't miss the edge. If you push it in over here, you're going to miss the edge, so you've got to concentrate on kind of putting it in at a slight angle. So watch. So you can see what I'm doing is I'm pushing with this hand the fabric and I kind of have even a bubble here. That keeps it well within the fold of the binding. Now I'm getting ready to go around a, a corner here. It's a pretty easy corner, but I just want to keep it in, pushed into that fold. This is the part I'm concentrating on right here. When I get to where the gap is, we're going to show you what we do there. Okay, we're coming up to that gap.
and we actually want to pull this apart to make this almost straight, so watch. So when I get to that corner here, one more stitch. So right here, I'm going to do some reversing. And then I'm actually going to take this out. So I've pulled, pulled out my binding, uh, I didn't cut it, and at this juncture, I'm going to splay this binding open and I'm going to put double-sided tape along both sides. Um, so it goes de definitely around this juncture. Both sides, I mean both undersides, like that. Okay, so make sure it's stuck on there well and then peel off the transfer paper. This is such a small gap that you need to do stuff like this because there's no way you're going to make it otherwise. If it were bigger, it'd be easy. So now what I want to do is I want to put this on by hand and make sure that my fold is the same on the top side and the bottom side. And this may take some, uh, uh, some time and you may have to peel it up a few times to get it perfectly right. So we're just trying to make sure that it's centered right and then we fold it over like that. Here we're going to do a, a miter, which we'll show. I'm not going to worry about that right now. So, let's position this a little bit better. You know, you're going to have a little gap in the middle because the fabric has to shrink and there's a little pucker there, but the fabric's turning a corner and I think that's pretty good. So I'm not going to put, put, push the binder back up into this thing yet. Uh, the needle's off to the right still, it's okay off to the right, just make sure we go through the binding. So let's sew here, and let's turn the worker bee dip down really slow so we do one stitch at a time. And we want to do some reversing here. Okay. I hope my hands are out of the way. Now I'm going to bury my needle, needle's coming up a little bit, I'm going to kind of push the fabric around here, trying to keep my hands out of the way. Pivot a little bit more, and we're going to sew up to this uh, edge here. Oops, I'm a little bit off here. I'm going to go like that. And then I'm going to do some reversing here, right at the edge. just basically one stitch on top of itself several times. And then we're going to pull this out. So we finally made it around this, uh, and there's a bump there, but that's expected. So now I'll show you what to do here. Okay, my double-sided tape goes into this miter a little bit. I'm actually going to just pull it out, because you can do that, and then just break it, bam, like that. And so now we're going to try to do a miter here. I'm going to pull some more binding out. So we're going to crease the fabric so it takes a nice turn here. You could just cut it off with a hot knife. It's a lot easier, actually, and then just start it over top of itself. But I want to try to show you how to do a miter. So I'm creasing it, something that looks pleasing, centering it here. That's a pretty big bump. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think we can do that. So that doesn't look too bad there. So I'm going to put a clip here just to kind of keep it in, in position. And I have a pretty good fold. It's kind of thick. I'm trying to figure if I can sew through that. I'm going to take my vice grips and I'm going to crimp that, um, trying to reduce the thickness of it. Otherwise, the sewing machine is going to skip stitches and all kinds of stuff here because this is just super thick. You can tell it's getting thinner as I do this. And I think I can do that. So again, we're not using the binder. 
we're going to put it in here. We're going to start sewing. Remember we did some reversing under here that you can't see because it was one stitch. I'm going to move my needle to the center position, but I got to remember that I did that so that I can put that stitch right where I want it. Super thick. I'm going to do this by hand. Hopefully we won't get a skip stitch. That's good so far. Now, before my needle enters again, I'm going to stop before it enters and I'm going to lift my foot and I'm going to reposition right where that stitch was first created and then lower my foot. And I'm going to do that a couple times just so I get a good, nice reverse. So penetrated, almost penetrate the fabric, stop, lift the foot, go back to the first hole, bury your needle in it, lower the foot, and that's enough. That should be pretty good reversing. So now, let's just sew a little bit up to this clip, and hopefully we're catching the underside. Might push this underside in so that we make sure that we catch it. I'm gonna sew a couple stitches. One, two, three. Bury the needle, move this, needle's buried. Now I'm going to put the binder back into position by pulling the binder through, the binding through the binder. And remember we said our needle is in the middle position, but we can't have it in the middle position. So what, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do one stitch out and then I'm going to move the needle to the right like it was when we were sewing the binding originally. And we're going to start right here. And hopefully that's pretty good. We're going to check it out here in a second. So yeah, that looks pretty good there. And the corner's got a wrinkle here, but that's expected because it had to take a sharp turn. We're going to keep sewing. Okay, we're coming up to the point where we uh, started to sew. And what I like to do is use a hot knife and actually cut this so that it overlaps a little, little bit. So that's what I'm going to do. Okay, you want to cut this so that it's uh, perpendicular to the edge. Edges. Boom. Like that. And I'm going to sew a little bit further up. But when I get to this point, I'm going to move the binder out of the way. And sometimes if you want it to be really professional, use seam stick. And uh, I'll, I'll do that and I'll show you how I do this. So I'm going to put some seam stick down from here to here on both sides. So I have seam stick on both sides and I like to push this on. You don't have to do the seam stick. It's just, it just keeps it all in place. And make it look as good as possible. You got a hot knife to edge there. And so now we're going to turn down the worker bee and we're going to go really slow into this. Not using the binder right now. And it won't be on top of itself completely because of the fact that it, obviously there's more bulk here. So your stitch is going to be a little bit outside your other one. And then we're just going to reverse here. go. Next up we'll be installing fasteners in our cover. This is our lock stud and I believe that's where we're going to start. So our cover uh, goes over and it is basically I could feel it right here. I'm going to put it close to the stitch. So I'm using my soapstone and I just mark the location of where that locks should be installed. So this is our Sayerite drill uh, hole a cutter set and we need to use a number two which I believe is this one it says on the side yep number two we have our cutting pad the beauty of this hole cutter is that you can do it without a hard surface so you just take this and mount it in a drill and we've got this hole cutter so we can just position it or hold it in our hand or do anything to get that hole let me lift this up We'll put it on the back side of our application. I'll just hold it up in the air. That's where we want it. There we go. Beautiful hole. 
This is the locks fastener. This is the button part portion. And this screws onto the back and we're going to use a, a key that's available at Sailrite. So we're going to take the button and just run it through the hole. Flip this over. And the back side goes on like this. You can usually start it by hand to get the threads going. And then we'll take our device and start securing it. And what we want is we want it to lock down pretty good. So keep going until it's nice and tight. And that probably will do it. If you want the locks logo to be over here, which I think I do, I can loosen it and turn it around, but she is installed. And so to install it onto the stud, lift the button and position it and it is locked down secure. Here's our YKK SNAD with a 40 millimeter. And we have this uh, locks fastener put in. I can feel the snap, in fact, that's the exact center of it. I'm using the soapstone. So that's where we want to install it. Yep. We're going to be using the press and snap tool. This uh, die holds the button in place with the rubber gasket. And then the socket gets snapped onto the top. So it's in place. And make sure the button goes on the correct side, which is this side. And since we have a hole there, all we have to do is depress it right over that spot and the snap is installed. And if you take a look at it, it's installed beautifully and she snaps like that. So we're positioning the fasteners and the way that I do it is I, I start uh, on one side. I've installed the locks there and a couple snaps there. And then I'll come over here. The lock's already installed here. We'll install some snaps here. And we'll kind of just work back and forth. We don't want this cover to fit super tight. This is a cover to protect our cushions. If it were super tight, it'd be irritating to install. And we don't want that. Our sun pad cover is now complete and we're gonna install it on the boat. Sailrite offers a wide variety of marine cover fabrics that would be appropriate for this project. Coming up, a list of the tools and materials we use to complete this project. If you have any questions, feel free to give us a call or email. We're glad to help. From all of us here at Sailrite, I'm Seth Grant. Thanks for watching.